Hello AP English Language and Composition students. Welcome to lesson 20. This one is uh, producing, creating cause-effect explanations, techniques and their effects. Identifying a technique, noting how it is has a purpose, and explaining how it creates that purpose. So we're gonna, I'm going to look at in the Roger Ascham wind description passage point out several sections and I will do my best on the spur of the moment to verbally create these technique uh, explanations. Some might be successful, some might not be as, but you'll get the idea. Your descriptions don't explain how, that's the difficult thing, and sometimes for what purpose too. So here we go. We start off with the first line, we're not going to do every single line, but to see the wind with a man his eyes, it is impossible. Even if we just looked at that, we could write several lines. What do we have? Now your grammar that you didn't watch on the videos is coming into play. This is my subject. It is, um, this is my verb and impossible, but this is 500 years ago. This is not archaic wording to the writer, right? It is impossible to see the wind. We have our subject and then our predicate. A predicate section of a sentence starts with a verb. And all the parts of the sentence that go along with that. Well, most of the predicate of the sentence precedes the subject. So this is an inverted sentence. Why does the author have an inverted sentence? What is he describing? Wind. Wind is not always linear, usually not. It has a twisty sort of motion. So what is the author doing? He is inverting his sentence, twisting it upon itself in order to recreate the effect of a swirling wind so that we, the reader, can experience that gust, that abnormalness of the wind, its uh, nonlinear characteristics, right? So he's setting us up for something that's going to be swirly, all right? So moving on. If you do, even so, up to the up to the first semicolon, and after this, it's still the same sentence. But he has a semicolon. He wants to continue on. But notice, to see the wind with a man in his eyes, it is impossible. The nature of it is so fine and subtle. Yet this experience, and that was in. At the same time that we have a very long sentence that continues on to the fifth line, we also have a choppy, we have a bunch of pauses, sort of a syncopated effect. So we have a long sentence and syncopation. Why? We always look at our end result. What's the author describing? What's his purpose? We've got to figure out the purpose, then we can explain how he gets there. He wants to describe and have the reader experience the full effects of the wind. So wind is continuous, sometimes for a long period of time. The over four lines, long extended sentence, not a run on, but there is one later, um, gives us that effect of a continual movement of the wind, and yet the wind has a variety, much variation, variability in its movement. It's gusty, it buffets you. And so we're getting that intermittent pauses. We are getting those intermittent pauses that also create the effect of the wind. Real life is at least 3D, <laughs> and we're getting a varied experience with a long sentence plus the pauses. So how would I write that out? Well, I think you got it from that. Maybe on another one I'll go back and put it in wording for the whole cause effect. So if we move on, we find that morning, right here, that morning the sun shone bright and clear, the wind was whistling aloft and sharp according to the time of the year. There's a few things going on at the same time here. We have one independent clause. It stops here, but the author chooses. He knows what he's doing. He has one run-on in this whole passage. 
He put it there purposefully. So he wants this sentence also to continue on to be lengthier to express the flowing of the wind. He does so, excuse me, he does so by purposefully not creating an end stop to this sentence, but allowing it to continue on. He'll override the grammatical rule to get the effect. But what is he doing? He actually ends this clause with clear and this with year. It's a rhyme. So poetic wording, like that which is atypical for prose writing, non-poetical writing is called prose, if he's putting that in, there is a purpose. He admires the wind. The wind to him is beautiful, impressive. And so he gives it a, a pleasing sound to his clause as something sort of pretty. All right? So what can I say about this one sentence? There's a lot to say. Um, in order to convey his respect and admiration for the wind, the author includes rhymed words at the end of successive clauses to create a poetic, beautiful sound. Um, and he chooses not to end the for, to end stop the first clause using a comma splice run on to allow a continual flow to mimic the flow of the wind overall so that we can experience what he is experiencing. He's not only experiencing the wind, he's experiencing emotions because of the wind. He's impressed and we're getting that with the rhyme. So my next part that I want to look at is where he uses sometime. Sometime and another time. So we have sometime, another time, sometime, and, and then down here we have extreme amount of repetition of sometime. One would stand. And so it continues, sometimes swiftly, or sometimes slowly, or sometimes broader, sometimes narrow, as far as I could see. Nor it flew not, nor not straight, but sometime it crooked this way, sometime that way, and sometime it ran about in a compass, and sometimes, so he goes on. Well, that's pretty extreme. You might call it anaphora, because each phrase begins with or subordinate, or clause begins with the word sometime. You could call it anaphora that way. Anaphora is the same word beginning successive phrases or clauses. We'll call it that. It is parallelism, though, for sure. But what is the quality of the wind here that he's highlighting? Through his use of anaphora of the word sometimes, and some other similar words of meaning, he is expressing the variability of the movement of the wind that it's very frequently changing in its characteristics. That's it. Okay. Now, the final paragraph. The final paragraph has the word and in, that's definitely an aphra. So, and begins his independent clauses. It started on the earlier page. What's the purpose? In the earlier page he had, and that was the most marvel of all. And now he has, and I saw two winds, and again I could hear, and when. So at least four times he has it. I mean, it could be more. But if we have that, what's the purpose? And again I should hear, and when? If you saw my uh, passage from Revelations 4, I think it was, 3 or 4, 
uh, the last book of the Bible, Revelations, the vision that John wrote about that he saw about the throne room of heaven. He was in rapture. He was spellbound at what he saw. It was otherworldly, John. Roger Ashton would have known that, would have read that. And the people, everyone had read the Bible that was literate, right? Or even if they weren't, they had heard it. So here, he probably remembered the effect that John had when he was carried away by the vision. He, that he probably wanted to recreate it, the breathless effect of almost like a little kid trying to get out one idea after another after another that he's so impressed with. That's what Roger Ashton is trying to recreate here. So through successive clauses beginning with and, Roger Ashton recreates the breathless effect the breathless expression even of a young child who can't get his ideas out quickly enough and wants to link them together. Ashton does this to convey his, mood, his awestruck tone with the wind. We know that's true because he uses the word marvel three times in this paragraph. Marvel, marvel, and then he had it earlier on. So we know that he, is, he has that feeling about the wind. Finally, though, if I'm not running out of time, um, and we're still under the 15 minutes, we do have a strange event at the end of the paragraph. But yet thereby I learned perfectly that it is no marvel at all. He contradicts his idea that it was a marvel. Why is he doing that? He's a scholar, and he's expressing quite a lot of emotion here, which is probably not befitting of uh, the tutor of the princess. So he is coming back down to rationality at the end to conclude, and he's leaving the emotion. So that's probably what he's doing here. So this contradiction um, is there for that reason, I believe. So hopefully those explanations can show you how, how to explain how a technique works, works. But nevertheless, I will show you some paragraphs of some students that went a good degree towards explaining these techniques, but not all the way. And hopefully talking about those and explaining those more fully will help you. Thank you.